Hello and welcome to Theoretical Probability. Yes, I know, how on earth can probability be theoretical? And actually, that's a really good question. What does theoretical mean? Well, obviously, later on we get to things like theoretical physics, and I'm like, well, if it's theoretical, how can... Your mind just goes down rabbit holes. Almost like when you watch YouTube videos of fluffy cats and end up watching more fluffy cats. Basically, theoretical probability is what we think will happen without doing any experiments. And the next video, or one that came actually prior to this one, deals with experimental probability, where we actually look at things that come from experiments. So what we tend to do here is we can use a best guess approach, as I say here, to find the chance of something happening. All right, we're normally using, do it using fractions, decimals, and percentages. Now, as a hint, it says here that the questions will always tell us what they want the answer to be written in. And again, please be careful to make sure that you RTQ, right? RTQ means read the question. So the first thing I'm going to look at is about possible outcomes. Now, an outcome can be called an event. All right, so again, we can come to the point of calling things events or outcomes. Lots of different words can be used in maths to describe this. But if we look at um, a coin, and this is a fabulous 50 cent coin from Australia. And the question says, list all the possible outcomes of a coin. Well, the chances are they're talking about the sides of a coin. And when we toss a coin, then what do we end up getting? We'll either get a head or a tail. And ladies and gentlemen, that's actually the possible outcome. Thanks very much. Moving on. What about the numbers on the dice? Well, yes, everyone should know that the numbers on the dice, the standard fair dice, will be one, two, three, four, five, and six. And to be honest with you, this possible outcomes doesn't get any harder than this. We looked on a previous lesson at what the suits from a pack of cards are, and they're shown here. So we have hearts, which if you remember are red. We have clubs, which are black. We have diamonds, which actually look like diamonds. And we have these things here, which are called spades, which sort of look like a shovel. And that's it. Listing the suits from a pack of cards would just require you to do hearts, clubs, diamonds, and spades. And what about the colours on the French flag? Well, I chose the French flag because there are three of them, and I have some fabulous French friends. And so the colours would be red, white, and blue. All right, so red, white, and blue. Nothing more complicated than that. And there are lots of things that they can ask you to do. So, for example, what about if we were asked to do uh, the outcomes from cost tossing a coin with a six-sided die? Well, if we think about throwing the coin first, we could end up with a head followed by the number one on the die. And then we could end up with a head or the number two. A head and number three. Head and four, head, and five, head, and six. So those are the six different outcomes that could happen when the coin lands on a head and the six-sided dice goes one, two, three, four, five, six. All I'm doing here is just listing them. And alternatively, we could end up having got a tail and a one, or a tail and a two, tail and a three, tail and a four, tail and a five, or a tail and a six. So there we go. If we were to go and toss a coin as well as roll a six-sided dice and look at all the possible outcomes, we would end up with 12 of them. Now, one of the great things about maths is, as I've said so many times, maths is the BFT, a big fat trick. And lots of questions turn around and say, well, list the sample space. So what on earth is this sample space stuff? Well, if you were to look up dictionary.com, dictionary.com, it would say the range of values of a random variable. That actually doesn't make any sense to me. It sounds like VCE maths. So I'm going to make it slightly simpler and say that the sample space is a list of outcomes. Hold on, we've already done that. Which are written with commas in between and surrounded by curly brackets. Really? That simple? Oh yes, I should cocoa. Whatever cocoa is. So if we now look at our coins, what do we have? We have the outcomes as a head and a tail. There is my comma, and there are my curly braces. Now, I've done them in color to make them look nicer for you. It doesn't mean you have to sit there and do them in red. But same with the French flag. What did we say? We had our outcomes of red, 
white and blue. The order doesn't matter. It didn't matter that I wrote blue, white and red. They don't have to come in alphabetical order. Are there commas between them? Yes, there are. Are there curly braces? Oh, yes, there are. Cards? Yep. Hearts, spades, clubs and diamonds. Those are my four outputs. And there is my curly bracket. And finally, my single fair six-sided die. Or one, two, three, four, five and six with my curly braces. And they say that this math stuff is complicated. We're going to have words with whoever that is. So when you get a question in math, just make sure you know what it is you're asking or what they're asking. Now, we've already done a little bit of this finding probabilities from outcome stuff in previous lessons, but doesn't, uh, doesn't, um, wow, it doesn't stop us from doing it again because all the work in year seven and eight and nine all revolves around pretty much the same stuff. So what is the probability written as a fraction of getting a head from a standard coin? Well, how many heads are there? Well, there is one head out of how many possible outcomes? Two, we say that this is the number of successes. Ooh, all right, so that's the thing we're looking for. And in this case, for a standard coin, there is only one head. And here is the number of possible outcomes. While wow, you're sitting there watching me write. That's weird, I should tell jokes. So, in that situation, the probability of getting a head is a half. What is the probability written as a fraction of getting a tail? Well, again, there's one tail out of two possible outcomes. Not exactly the most challenging of maths, really, is it? So let's ramp it up a bit and try and see what happens when we get a die. What is the probability, again, written as a fraction of getting a one? I thought you said this was going to get harder. No, no, that was me, not you. How am I hearing voices in my head? Moving on! The probability of getting a one. How many ones are there? There's one one. Out of how many different possible outcomes? Six. What is the probability written as a fraction of getting a five? Well, again, there is only one five out of six. Finally, it gets a little bit more complicated. And again, remember, all of these questions are fractions, so I'm not going to keep repeating that. So what is the probability of getting an odd number? If we remember, the odd numbers are 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. Now, hold on a moment. We're just dealing with a six-sided die. So we don't need to go above the number 6, or in this case, the number 5. So what is the probability? Well, there are three odd numbers out of six possible outcomes. That is not my final answer because it can be cancelled down. Both of those numbers can be divided by 3, and so... To keep things balanced, if we divide the top and the bottom by three, we end up with a half. All right, what is the probability of getting an even number? Well, the even numbers are two, four, and six. And once again, there are three out of six even numbers, which is one out of two in terms of the lowest cancel down fraction. What is the probability? This is the final one of getting a number greater than four. My advice to you is to actually write them down. I want the numbers greater than four. So that's five and six. There's no numbers bigger than four on a die because the number six is the highest number it becomes. So how many of those are, how many of those outcomes are greater than four? There's two of them out of six. And because they're both even numbers, I'm going to halve them. It gives me one over three. And I can't actually do that anymore. Well, Probability being probability and maths being maths actually uses all sorts of different examples to help us find probabilities. So what has that got to do with the price of fish? Well, first things first, writing the word probability is too long. Mathematicians are lazy. They don't spend all day lying in bed. What that means is writing that word probability is way too much. So we found a way of writing it shorter. And here are some examples just here. So PR actually means find the probability. And we put what we want to find in a set of brackets. So this means find the probability of getting a head. And I would assume in that situation it's for a coin. Find the probability of getting a tail. Find the probability of getting an odd number. Probability of getting an even number. Wow, now we're back to this die, PR1. It seems a lot, lot quicker to write this stuff rather than write the word probability all the time. Right, 
What about this one here? Probability of getting a vowel. Well, maths uses words as much as we use numbers. And to try and throw you, they may actually give you a lateral word. Oh, look, hold on a moment, everyone. Here's a word. Mathematics. Remember, vowels are the letters A, E, I, O, and U. So if I'm going to try and find the probability of a vowel, I'm going to look for how many A's, E's, I's, O's, and U's I have, and probably divide it by the total number of letters. Right, let's give it a go. Here is the word mathematics. What is the pr -m? Remember, that is, what is the probability of getting the letter M? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask myself, how many M's do I have? And one, two of them are letters M. So I'm going to write equals, two of them are letters M. And I'm going to divide that by what? 26, because there's 26 letters in the alphabet. Uh, no, not 26. We need to count how many letters are in the word mathematics, because that's what we're doing, the probability for mathematics. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. So two out of eleven, can that be cancelled down? Yes. Nope, because eleven is a prime number. And as a result of it being a prime number, it can't be cancelled down any lower than it currently is. That's nice and easy. What about the probability of getting a letter A? How many A's are there? One, two. There are two letters A's as well. And as such, two over 11. What about the probability of a letter S? How many S's are there? There's just the one out of 11. Now, what about a trick question? What about the probability of getting the letter Z? Well, how many letter Z's do you see there? Absolutely none. None over 11, which we generally would just write as zero. And what does the probability zero mean? It means impossible. Because in that situation, are there any Z's in that letter, in that word, sorry? Absolutely not. Last part of this lesson, ladies and gentlemen, talks about the probability that something doesn't happen if we know that something does happen. All right, so here's a question for you. If I know the probability of it raining on a particular day is equal to one half, what is the probability that it doesn't rain? Now, the way we say doesn't rain in maths is put a little line on top of it. Oh, that's rushing ahead to a little bit of VCE. But if it's going to rain as a half, what's the probability it isn't going to rain? Well, that's weird. Oh, now, hold on a moment. We use something that we actually know here. Remember, the probability of something not happening is zero. So the probability that something is impossible is zero. The probability of something being certain is either 100% or, actually, as in, if I was going to write that as a decimal number, it would actually be 1. So the maximum probability is the number 1, which means that all probabilities, when added together, should add up to one. Well, if we know the probability it's going to rain is a half, and it's either going to rain or it's not going to rain, well then the probability it's not going to rain must also be a half, because what does a half plus a half add to give? One, absolutely. Here's another one. What if it's the probability that I uh, I don't know um, it's going to be snowing tomorrow? is 1 out of 10, which in Melbourne, Australia is probably, uh, I don't think I've ever known it's snow in Australia and Melbourne. If the probability is snowing, what is the probability it's not going to snow? So putting a line over. Well, if this one and the answer there have to add to be 1, then that can only be 9 over 10. And actually, same thing sort of works with percentages and decimals. If the probability of getting the letter A in a particular word is 0 0.3, then the probability of not getting a letter A must be 0 0.7. If you add those two together, what do they get? You get one. And so it goes on and on and on. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that, I think, is the end of this 
little jaunt through theoretical probability. Remember, the reason it's called theoretical probability is because we're basing it on theory of what we think is going to happen based on the outcomes that are there. When we actually throw a coin, when we throw a die, we might actually find out that there's different results. And that's what the next video works on. The next video works on experimental probability, which actually gets you to throw die and coins and all sorts of other things to try and work out whether there is actually a 50-50 chance of getting a head and a tail. Are the probabilities a half and a half? Is there an even chance? Okay, guys, this has been fun. I'm looking forward to seeing you the next time. Take care.